thank you very much for having me. Um, I always get thoroughly nervous, so all of you are in a better position than I am, so just smile back at me occasionally, especially if you see me going pale. Um, but hopefully I will bring in some aspects of how to use this practically in, in your life. I feel like it's all very practical in your life, obviously, I wouldn't be wearing this. Um, but uh, a little bit about me, uh, as you just said, I, I've been studying, I, I took refuge in 96, so that was, you know, 14 years ago, yeah, and so I had taken some classes before that. In our tradition, that really, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, that really is sort of a, the kickoff, you know, that for me was very true. I engaged very you know, seriously from then on, um, and was ordained as a nun four years after that. So I just passed after uh, May of this year, was my 10th anniversary as a nun. Um, I'm in the Galukpa tradition of the Tibetan Buddhism, which is the same one that the Dalai Lama is in. That's he, we use him as our PR guy. He actually <laughs> makes sure that he trains himself in all the traditions, and because he's he's also politically the head of all Tibetan people, so he doesn't want to play favors that way. But he was trained up in, brought up in <laughs> the um, in the Galukpa school of Tibetan Buddhism, and that is a Mahayana tradition, which is similar to Zen in that way. Um, and we'll touch on that a little bit in, in this talk this afternoon. So what I'm going to do is I'll sort of bull through with some of the presentation and then I'll open it up for some questions at the end. Um, I always bring notes because I have a lousy memory. <laughs> and that way if I start going too far off tangent, then something goes off in my mind and I think, oh, look back at the notes. Because there's very little time in, as far as I'm concerned to cover a wealth of material. So I'm going to do my best. I hope not to pull you over. Um, and then at the end we'll take some questions. And we can continue the questions upstairs over mm -hmm. cookies and cake, right? So, so you don't, if you don't get your, your question in, then we, we can cover it upstairs. So the Four Noble Truths. Um, again, also as Stephen said, I'm really supposed to be covering the first three, and then I'm supposed to just touch on the fourth, because then the remaining three talks will really be covering the fourth, as it breaks out into the Eightfold Noble Path. Um, so, but I will touch on it, because of course it, it relates very strongly to the other three, and it's kind of the best news. So, <laughs> so you, you give me the hardest ones, and then, and then all these other people get to come in and, and have the cake and ice cream, right? So, <laughs> So, um, the Four Noble Truths is the first teaching that the Buddha gave. So it's actually really the most famous teaching, and it covers all of Buddhism, basically. So in the next 35 minutes, I'm going to cover all of Buddhism um, as well as I can. Um, it is the truth of suffering, or there is suffering, is actually the way I phrased it. There is suffering. There is a cause of that suffering. There is an end or cessation of that suffering. And there is, the good news, a path to that cessation that all of us can take. What he actually said, according to the translations that I have studied, is suffering is to be understood, cessation is to, oh, the cause is to be abandoned, freedom is to be realized, and the path is to be cultivated. I'll say that again. Suffering is to be understood, the cause is to be abandoned, Freedom is to be realized, and the path is to be cultivated. So that's actually the instructions, as well as the truths. So the first truth is uh, that there is suffering. I like the fact that he said there is suffering, rather than we are suffering, or something like that. It's, he's simply stating a fact. It's a hard fact. It's a hard way to start, but it's also the first of the noble truths that we don't need to be realized beings to get, right? All of us have had some amount of suffering in our lives, no matter how old or how young or how fortunate or how unfortunate we've been. And in fact, many of us have come to some spiritual study or, or practice because we've had some suffering. It's not, a, it's not necessarily an evil thing, suffering. It sometimes brings us to more serious things. So, the suffering is to be understood, if you think of it in that sense, what is suffering from the Buddhist point of view? That's where it gets juicy, because he's not just talking about headaches and broken arms, you know? He's talking about this thing called dukkha in, in Sanskrit, which we translate as suffering. 
but it actually can come down to the dissatisfied mind. And if we start talking about the dissatisfied mind, they're suffering all over the place. We are all probably suffering in here, even if those of us who don't have bad knees and bad backs and, and um, are maybe painful butts. Um, so Dukkha is talking about really this dissatisfied mind that comes up all the time and keeps us from ever being satisfied or content or happy. And that's what the Buddha is really pointing out. And so if we understand that and we understand deeper and deeper levels of what suffering is, and that's, that's really a point I want to make, then, then we can start seeing that what really causes our suffering is expecting it to be different. And he's pointing it out not to be a complete downer or to depress us, but simply pointing out a reality of our situation, that there is suffering. Suffering exists. Luckily, he didn't stop there. We'd all just go out and commit suicide, you know, right? So there's no, we would have, there would be no point to this whole talk. We'd all just go up and gorge on the cake and then just go home and get sick. So we want to look at what he means by suffering. Um, and again, by suffering, he's not just talking about um, sicknesses and physical pain and mental pain and mental illness. He's talking about fear and stress and worry and depression and um, all those things that, that cause our mind to, to suffer. And if our mind is suffering, then our body is definitely suffering. So, some of, sometimes it's condensed when the Buddha talks about um, suffering, he talks about um, aging, sickness, and death, right? Those are the things that caught his attention when he, when he escaped from his palatial um, prison that his father built for him so he would never see suffering, so he'd never become spiritual. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for us, he escaped and he saw evidence of aging, sickness, and death. So sometimes it's condensed that way. I think one of the more powerful ways to think about it, there are, are what are called the three levels of suffering, which are almost like unpeeling the onion <laughs> of suffering. Um, the first one is the one we think of as suffering, suffering of suffering. We call it in, in Tibetan Buddhism, gross suffering, physical suffering, broken arms, stitches, headache, you know, flu. Um, and that, that animals know, you know, that's nothing new to us, and animals know that, and animals try to avoid suffering too. The second one, I think, is where it starts getting really juicy, is the suffering of change. And the suffering of change is what basically we think of as pleasure. Always causes suffering at some point because either it ends, and we don't want it to, like the cake, right? We eventually finish the piece. <laughs> or it turns into suffering because we grab another piece and want the same amount of pleasure to keep coming into us. We keep having more and more and more until we, we throw up. Um, or someone takes the cake away. Or, you know, there's lots, and we get bored of the cake. That happens a lot too, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we think our happiness is in that cake or that person or that job or that car. And then after a month or two or three, we aren't so interested in that person or that cake or that job or that car. Um, we start seeing sort of the, the we start getting dissatisfied, that dukkha, that, that, that mind of ours that keeps us from being fully satisfied. And another example, and I like this example of this one, Suffering of Change, is we're standing in the hot sun, and this is a good one today, because I walked over and I tried to stay out of the sun, I stayed in the shadow. You're in the sun because you're cold, right? You leave the house, it feels really nice. And then after a few minutes, it starts feeling really painful, so you move to the shade, and then you start getting really cold. This happens a lot in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So you move back into the sun, and then you move back into the shade, and then you move back into the sun, and this all, and all day long. Um, and that's the suffering of change, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And then the third level is the deepest level, or the most subtle level, and that's what's called all-pervasive suffering. And this is one that's difficult to understand, but it plays on, it gets a little bit into the second truth. It, it's talking about the fact that our body and our gross mind, our environment, all the beings within and our experience of it, everything is created by karma and delusions, mental afflictions. And so, therefore, it is in the nature of Dukkha. It is, by its very nature, imperfect. 
and our craving for perfection and constantly trying to make it perfect causes us to suffer. So it's sort of like it's, it's built in obsolescence, it's built in imperfection, and we keep trying to find perfection in this. But we haven't yet created the causes for perfection, which is all that we have to do according to Buddhist instruction. So why did he point this out? You know, why did he start with their suffering? Why did he start with these four noble truths? He wants us to recognize that they're suffering so that we can begin to see that there doesn't have to be suffering. That it's possible for us to end suffering. Buddhism is actually incredibly radical in that aspect. It's possible to live without suffering. He did it, and there is a method to that. As I said, if he had stopped there, it would have been really depression. But no, he went on and said, there's a cause to that suffering, just like, I'm really sick, doctor, what do I do? Well, you know, it, these germs are what caused you to be sick, so we have to get rid of those germs. And then there is a possibility of you being free of those germs, and then there is a way for you to get there. And that's really what the Four Noble Truths are. So he mapped it out for us. If we don't see that we're suffering, it's sort of like we're sitting there in this prison and we haven't figured out that we created the causes of this prison. And we, the, we have the key to this prison and we can get out. We just are happily sitting in the prison not realizing that we have created it and that we have a way out. And that there is a way to have happiness that's not just a relief of want. Which is basically what our happiness is now according to the Buddha. The Buddha is basically like, hey kids, you know, you don't have to do this anymore. You don't have to keep craving for stuff and then getting bored with it. And it's kind of like little kids in the playground and saying, there's actually this whole big world out there. And, and you guys have the access to it. You have the keys to it. So that's really what, what he was doing with the Four Noble Truths. But he had to start with, let's recognize the bad news first. Second Noble Truth is... Um, is telling us what caused it. He, that's where he gets into the germs. <laughs> the germs in this case, there, there are causes of this suffering, and there are two main causes of this suffering according to Buddhism. And I, of course, am speaking totally from the Tibetan tradition because that's all I know. So, um, um, The two causes of our suffering are karma and delusions. I'm going to start with delusions first. This is a funny word. It's klesha, or kleshas in Sanskrit. I like the word klesha, actually. I like it better than anything we've come up with. We sometimes call it delusions, because it does make us delusional. Um, I like mental afflictions, actually, a little bit better. I think it's a little bit more precise. It's basically defined as anything that disturbs our mind. So it's not just all outrage. It's, I don't really like the color of the wall. I don't like your shirt. You know, it's all that kind of little stuff. <laughs> you got that on film, right? Yeah, but I don't like your <laughs> So it's, it's little tiny disturbances of our minds, and sometimes those are the most active, as well as, um, you know, all outrage or, or, or paralyzing depression or, um, um, you know, um, huge jealousy that would cause us to, to kill somebody or something like that. It doesn't have to be just the big stuff. It's all that little stuff. And in fact, that little stuff almost does more damage because we do it every day. Mm -hmm. right? That little critical mind that comes into a room of 50 people and only sees faults, you know, just like that. So those are actually considered the root cause of our suffering because we have these states of mind all the time and then we act on them. And when we act on them with our speech, or our bodies, or our thoughts, we create karma. And we create karma all the time. They say 64 times per finger snap we're creating karma. Mostly negative because of ignorance. You know, we just don't know. Um, and karma creates everything. And I was going to use this. It's perfect. Thanks, guys. It's like the only time I've ever thanked the... Uh, the um, Fleet Week guys, but um, every experience that we have in our entire life and lives, and we've had many prior to this, and we'll have many more until we get enlightened, and we all will get enlightened at some point, um, according to my school, <laughs> um, is created by our karma. 
So there's no creator God in Buddhism. We create our reality through our karma, and all karma can be purified. So it's not some sort of, um, there's not a, like a destiny or fate thing about karma. Karma is, is constantly changing and constantly um, creating our reality. And what happens when we become a Buddha is we're only creating incredibly pure karma, so we only can experience bliss because we're only you know, doing positive things. So we get this incredibly great um, um, reality. So we have these two causes. They say the root of them is the, the mental afflictions or the kleshas um, because they disturb our mind and cause us to act. But then the karma is almost like an energy or an imprint that stays in our subtle mind as that mind goes to life to life and then ripens when the conditions come about. So that is what samsara is. So samsara, if people hear the term samsara, samsara is the creation, sort of our mind running amok, creating these kleshas and then, the kle and then following these kleshas as though they were our best friends and creating karma. That's really all samsara is. The removal of that leads us to truth number three, which is there is cessation. It's possible to be free of all of this. And all nirvana is, which is the opposite of samsara, which is also an experience of our mind and a creation of our mind, is having a mind completely free of all karma and delusions. Um, so the, the, the fact that there is cessation, that cessation is possible, and I don't like this word cessation, I actually like freedom because I don't use it any other time. I like using words that people actually use, like freedom or um, end. There is an end to this suffering. Um, this, this actually is what, um, this is where we start getting into what practice is about. I actually feel that the second noble truth, um, the cause of suffering, we have to spend some time studying that one, especially karma. I find karma incredibly exciting to work with because it's not something static. It's not something that keeps me in a certain place. I actually can work with it every day. I can experiment, as one of my students says, um, take these teachings and then experiment. You know, does it make me happier to be kind? Does it make me happier to, to be generous? Do I notice money coming in if I'm more generous? Um, she's doing like little experiments in that way, which I think is great. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to take the teachings of the Buddha and, and test them like gold. And he said, don't just follow them because you like me and like the words. So the third noble truth, the fact that there is uh, an end to this suffering, this is where he starts getting completely over the top. <coughs> this is when it almost sounds like a fairy tale. How could I, sometimes I just have my students, but I also try to do it myself, just contemplate what it would be like to have a mind completely free of these afflicted states of mind. Even just for a minute. If anyone's uh, meditated for a while and has gone deeply into meditation, you experience at least a, a temporary relief from that crazy mind, right? Um, and I think that's why people sometimes meditate. In, in our tradition, it's not considered to be the main cause. <laughs> We're supposed to be training our mind to the point where we can have a direct perception of reality and we can you know, progress along the path and get enlightened. But one of the nice perks is that we're free of this crazy mind of ours for just a, a few moments at a time. Um, and, and one of my teachers would say, this, this is proof that we can do it. Because if you can be free of it for a little bit, then you can be free of it. it you just have to expand that exponentially, you know. Um, so we, we get to this place of cessation by working with our minds, and we have to work with them in a couple of ways, studying and contemplating the teachings, of course, because otherwise we don't know um, what to meditate on. But this path is specifically, or this truth is specifically um, worked on in meditation. So definitely deep states of meditation um, is what we're trying to get to. And this, um, I think this is really important because it shows us that we have to look within. In fact, in Tibetan Buddhism, the word for somebody who has taken refuge, who I jokingly call a refugee, <laughs> only half jokingly actually, a refugee, they use a term that's, um, that means inner being. Somebody who's learning to look within. So by the time you're getting to this third truth, you're figuring out, 
it's not out there. As much as I want to blame you guys or those guys who are flying overhead or whatever, I have to look within. I have to begin to tame these demons in my own mind or I'm not going to find the peace. And that starts getting us into the daily work. That and working with karma. Because if I start really understanding that I have created the causes for the guys to fly over, <laughs> then I don't have to get mad anymore. What, who am I getting mad at? I'm getting mad at me, right? I must have flown over a lot of Zen temples in my day <laughs> and created a lot of noise like that. I mean, it, it's definitely coming at This is my birthday week, and this happens every year on my birthday week, the flying overhead thing. So. So I'm just letting it exhaust in this lifetime. I'm not going to get angry about it. So then the fourth noble truth um, is that there is a path to this cessation, this stopping, this liberation. And this is really referring to um, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, which Stephen had, had talked about. The next three talks is really going to um, deal with the Noble Eightfold Path. But this is also what we do every day. This is how we take the teachings into our lives and work with them. This, this is talking about our sitting practice and our retreats and the classes that we do, but also whether we're nice to people, whether we're patient when somebody's irritating, whether we're generous, whether um, we try to change the way that we normally habitually react to things, the way, you know, whether we try to develop qualities of kindness, compassion, and love or not. Um, this, that's the path. This is really the path. This is the stuff that we call practice. I mean, that's really all it is. It's, it's also the most satisfying work that you ever will do, and it's definitely the most meaningful work that you'll ever do. Um, and this is really what gets us enlightened. And that's, I do want to say, in my tradition, um, in the Tibetan tradition, we're going, I'm going for full enlightenment. You know, I'm not just going for nirvana, although I mentioned nirvana in this situation because it's traditionally what's taught in this section on cessation. Full enlightenment is, is a step beyond that, and that's looking around. If I know, if I understand suffering, so I've, I've taken these four noble paths, if I understand suffering, if I understand that there's a cause to be abandoned, and I understand that it's possible to realize cessation, and I decide I'm going to go for it, and then all of a sudden I look around and I see all of you guys, and I know that you're suffering, I don't want to leave you behind. At some point, I want to develop my compassion to the point that your suffering is, is at least as unbearable as my own. Mm -hmm. And that's when I enter the Bodhisattva path, and that's what the difference is. Then I'm going for full enlightenment for the benefit of all beings, not just those in this room, <laughs> but all of you too, <laughs> um, and, and all insects and all, all living beings, period. Um, and that's the difference there, is, and that's what full enlightenment is. Full enlightenment is taking one step further so that um, I, I am um, going to gain all of the capacities and all the tools of a Buddha so that then I can help you get enlightened too. That's really the idea. The main drawing or the main underlying emotion is compassion, but the tools are in enlightenment. Um, that's why I'm choosing to get enlightened, because it's the best method. So that fourth noble truth is really how we, how we get there. That's really all it is. And so we'll break that down in the, in the next few talks, but um, it's basically all the things that we do in our everyday life that begin to change our mind. And first beginning with just developing that awareness of our mind and how it works. You know, It's one thing for you all to hear this, and I'm sure many of us have heard this, probably many of you have heard it many times more than I have even, um, but it, it's not the same, we haven't realized it yet until our minds have really done the work and changed. And in Buddhism, that's actually one of the interesting things. It's not like somebody, the Buddhas become Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas become Bodhisattvas. They want to help us, but ultimately it falls on us to do the work. They can't get into our minds and make us be kind. <laughs> you know, They can't get into our minds and make us sit down and meditate. They can um, pop up in interesting ways, like the annoying guy in the bus to help you practice your patience. You know, they can, they can you know, pop up here and there in our lives um, as the mother who's screaming at us or something like that. And they do. 
but they can't then make our mind do anything, you know? Because in Buddhism, it's not like that. It's not like a savior in that sense. It's they can teach us, and they have taught us, and they will teach us, and they will continue to teach us. And then ultimately, what we do with it is up to us. And that, I think, is what becomes the path. Mm -hmm. So did that kind of give you what you wanted? <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we open it up for some questions, actually? I was so afraid of not having enough time. I just was like, oh my god, I'm going to have to caffeinate highly before I go on over the whole thing. Um, so I'm actually, I probably skipped half of it. But if people have questions, and it can be anything related to anything. Because this is the beginning, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>